we open up tonight and, um, and go on. The topic of an addiction crisis does plague our nation. You might not be aware of this, but in the context of the world, America is now known as the addict nation worldwide. We have more forms of addiction in America than most other several countries combined. You know, you could, you could look at it this way, that our addictions go beyond just alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, pornography. They now include all forms of social media. And if you use the standard definition for an addiction, it's something where you have given control away from yourself, out of self-government, to something else controlling you. You can include social media and texting and virtual reality, which I remind you is not reality. However, the plague of opioid addiction, particularly, has gotten the attention of many in the town of Plymouth, and of course in other areas also. Statistics have made the problem one that closely parallels the plague. It knows no boundary of race, no boundary of age or background, though it rests on the poor choices of its victims. It brings such bondage to the individual as like a vice grip that defies what appears to be the most determined person with a determined will to get free. In its wake, a foam of sadness, where parties end in unintended heartache, budding athletic careers end in addiction, and innocent curiosity and hunger for acceptance ends in the hospital. In the face of this spiraling problem, I'm proud, by the way, of the town of Plymouth, what the town of Plymouth has done. And they've come together with an all-hands-on-deck philosophy. And its increased communication has brought every agency together into the atmosphere of a team to build safety nets for these victims. I now serve on three drug task forces at the county, regional, and local town level. And uh, as the pastor of a church, of course, I come from a perspective that sees the ultimate solution as one where individuals find their true acceptance before their creator through Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting that in all three of these committees, the atmosphere has been built in such a way that when I share my perspective and anyone else shares theirs, all ideas are welcome on the table. And that tells me that we have an atmosphere to solve a crisis. When we say you can't say one thing and you, you can't bring up, we're going to need every single aspect for a solution to this. And we're not going to be able to simply segment it. And... Uh, so I, I want to make sure that you, you recognize that in the context of uh, why I'm here and why I ask to be able to host this meeting. And we know that uh, tonight, of course, we address the legalization of marijuana. Like most topics, it has proponents who are passionate. We've asked Senator Vinny DiMacito, along with District Attorney Michael O'Keefe from the Cayman Islands, to come and make this presentation. Um, and bring forth some facts that often are not brought to the table. I think you all know that um, if you go back in history to the founding of our country, Ben Franklin often had the greatest little sayings. And he said always the truth. He said the following. He said, do never ever fear having truth and lies openly presented because anyone can tell the difference. But the real problem comes when one side is shut off and out of the debate. And then deception rules the day. So it's important and imperative to recognize the free expression of ideas are important and they need to be protected. Hello everyone. Thank you for having us here today. This is uh, my good friend District Attorney O'Keefe and myself uh, here doing a presentation for our campaign for safe and healthy Massachusetts. Uh, just a little bit of background uh, in regards to this. Uh, many years ago, I, I would hear about this concern from District Attorney O'Keefe in regards to what happened with the decriminalization of marijuana and then ultimately the medical marijuana fight that happened back in 2012. And, uh, and she had that this, what, what the plan was in, in four years was to do the medical, the total legalization. And of course, you know, this is something I wasn't dealing with all the time. However, about a year and a half ago, uh, it was becoming very clear that this was the this was going to happen, and we're moving along. And so he's he'd been talking about it for quite some time. And and actually, I remember we were at the Falmouth Republican Town Committee, and you had cheered um, about you know the THC and and all of the you know the the, the 
extent to how much more potent it was, and I had no idea about this. Nonetheless, as it started to progress, we realized we had an issue on our hands, and, um, and I'd say, you know, Michael, myself, a whole group of people started reaching out to the governor and talking to the governor and saying, Governor, you know, you, you got to do something. This is happening and we need to educate people. And clearly with a, a vote that happened with a 70-30 vote for medical marijuana, we've got an issue on our hands and we need to stand up and fight. And I, had, I was fortunate I had the privilege of going to Cal Colorado. I was actually sent, uh, one of eight members from the Massachusetts Senate was sent to Colorado and uh, try to find out how, how is it that this played out in Colorado? What is going on? And it was actually the Senate president um, who sent us out there. But when doing that, we started to realize we really have a real issue on our hands. And we went back and we briefed the governor. Uh, and uh, from that point, the governor realized this, this is, uh, there, there are a lot of other issues I really never thought about. And we were able to present to the governor and the governor um, created what we call the Campaign for Safe and Healthy Massachusetts. He reached out to the Attorney General, the Mayor, we reached out to the Speaker of the House, um, and in and, and bringing this together, um, we are now, put, we have now created an organization that is actually going to try to educate people um, about the, the concerns that we have about legalization and really be the opposition to the proponents. And uh, for that, um, this is the presentation that we've put together, but I want to take a, a few moments to allow the district attorney to introduce himself and to talk about an issue that he's been very passionate for many, many years, and I really believe uh, has just has a, such a wealth of knowledge and, frankly, a wealth of experience uh, in this issue. And so, so with that, thank you, district attorney O'Keefe. Thank you, Vinny. I, do I need this microphone? Yes. 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 Really? Okay. Um, several years ago, uh, one of the young assistant DAs in my office uh, was about to get married and she asked me to perform the ceremony. And you can do that, you go, you apply to the governor and he gives you a one day uh, sort of ability, a credential that you can actually perform a wedding ceremony. So on that occasion and on this one, uh, it's as close as I'm ever going to get to the pulpit. <laughs> But, but I, I, I want to talk to you just briefly about three aspects of the proposed marijuana ballot law for Massachusetts and why I think they would be very harmful to both the public health and the public safety. First, let's start with some basics. As you've heard in the presentation that was put together by, I think Heidi put that together, didn't she? Heidi Hallman is a wonderful a woman and part of the steering committee with Vinny and I and the governor and the attorney general and, and this bipartisan group that is, is working very hard to do really one thing and it's, it's to put the message out. And you know, the proponents of this ballot question in November are probably gonna have far more money than we will have, but we know that our message is much better and if we have the ability to get the message out, we're, I think, going to be successful. So let's start with some basics. The, the medical and scientific community tells us that the active ingredient in marijuana, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, as you've heard, is four to 20 times higher than the marijuana of the 60s. And even in the Massachusetts general laws, which uh, you know, people in my profession and in assistant district attorney's profession, you know, they're, they're our Bible, we go by them all the time. The definition of marijuana is a, a plant that has tetrahydrocannabinol at 2.5% because, you know, when you pick that out of the ground in Mexico or some warm climate in the southeastern part of the country, the marijuana plant, it's 2.5% THC. This stuff that is being sold in Colorado and Washington and these other places that have legalized recreational marijuana and right here in Massachusetts through medicinal marijuana is 18%, 15%, multiples of the 2.5% of this naturally growing plant and it is obviously very very potent and very 
problematic, particularly uh, for young people. Current data estimate that more than 30% of current users have a, a cannabis marijuana disorder. Demand for marijuana addiction treatment is growing globally. Just a couple of weeks ago, the United Nations convened a symposium on this problem of marijuana addiction throughout the world. The younger that marijuana is used by people, the higher the rates of addiction to marijuana and other drugs, including opioids. The data goes on and on and was compiled, these few little medical and scientific things that I'm telling you, don't take my word for those things. There's a wonderful woman, Dr. Bertha Madras, who was the uh, head of the Office of White House Drug Control Policy uh, and retired from that job in 08, came back to Massachusetts and resumed her duties at uh, Harvard Medical School where she's uh, the head of the Department of Psychiatry. She has assembled this data. So with that as a backdrop, let's just consider three things increased pot use among 12 to 17 year olds, the illegal grows of marijuana and the black market, and a recent uh, American Automobile Association study regarding fatalities associated with THC intoxication, and why knowing about this data tend to argue against bringing this to Massachusetts. So increased use by kids. The Office, again, of National Drug Control Policy tells us that current marijuana use for Colorado kids, age 12 to 17, has increased 20% since recreational marijuana was passed in 2012, while use for that same age group has declined by 4% nationally. So what does that what does that tell you? When you make something more available, it's going to be used more. And it's not just going to be used by people over 21 that the law says you have to own, you know, sell it just to people over 21. As you saw from the video, this is a big industry whose fiduciary duty to their shareholders and investors is to grow the market. And how do you grow the market? You get kids hooked. Is this something that we want to bring to Massachusetts? The black market doesn't disappear when marijuana is legalized. It flourishes. Colorado Springs just last week, just last week, had several series of drug arrests for large-scale grows by Cuban nationals who have moved from Florida and bought uh, all kinds of houses that were uh, not being used. They were houses that were uh, for sale, they were abandoned, and the Pueblo, Colorado Sheriff and the DEA say that these are Cuban cartel members whom they've arrested in several large-scale drug busts out there. They take over the homes, turn them into greenhouses and are growing, quote, hundreds and hundreds of plants in each house and transporting it out of state to marijuana markets nationally and internationally. Can you imagine that? We're now exporting marijuana to other countries. And this is according to John Southers, the Colorado Springs mayor. And Mr. Southers is also the former attorney general for the state of Colorado. Do we want that in Massachusetts? Driving while high on THC. In Massachusetts, driving under the influence of drugs is just as illegal as driving under the influence of alcohol. But in more than 30 years as a prosecutor, I have seen very few cases prosecuted of driving under the influence of drugs. It's very difficult to do that. 
there is no readily available means for police to detect and marshal evidence of THC impacting the ability to drive. We don't have a breathalyzer machine for THC like we have for alcohol. But where the evidence of this does show up is on the autopsy table. The Automobile Association of America has released a study that reports one in six drivers involved in a fatal crash in Washington in 2014 had recently used the drug. This report, analyzing vehicular accidents in Washington, found that the number of fatal crashes involving drivers who recently used marijuana doubled after the state legalized the drug in 2012. Do we want that in Massachusetts. So these are just a few of the, the questions that I hope that you satisfy yourself with, that you understand this information and data before you cast a ballot in November. And you know, if you're here tonight, uh, you know, your neighbors are going to know maybe they couldn't come. They're going to ask you questions about this. And I hope that you will become someone who passes the word along to your neighbors and friends. I don't think that we want this in Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the stuff you've put together. Now we're going to actually do a, a PowerPoint presentation. I found that not only is it good to hear, the, hear it, but sometimes to see statistically the graphs and whatnot help you to remember so that we can have some of these points that are important. Because as the district attorney shared, this is not something that's going to be voted on legislatively. Le legislatively. You are going to be the legislators. You are the ones that are going to be voting. And I always say the devil's in the details. And so when you hear a bill, something's a good idea or not, that, you know, it, it is, there's a piece of legislation behind it, and there's always things that you need to be concerned about. It's a 24-page um, bill that is going to be on the ballot in 2016 that basically makes the argument, yes, marijuana, no marijuana, is it okay to use it, same as alcohol. That's the argument. But what you're going to find out is the ballot initiative is far more than that, and we're going to start to, to go through this. So this right now is... Um, Next slide. Again, we have a, a, a growing bipartisan coalition of families and community leaders. Um, just recently, the Massachusetts Hospital Association, Mass Medical Society, Association of, of Behavioral Health Care have come out in opposition. They've joined our coalition. Uh, business, uh, the businesses, we've had the Associated Industries of Massachusetts. Funny, about three weeks ago, Cape Cod, um, the Boston Globe came and said, did a story about the fact that the business uh, industries are really not um, concerned about the medical, I mean, the legalization of marijuana. And since then, the Associated Industries of Massachusetts, AIM, came out in opposition and had a presentation three days ago with the Retailers Association of Massachusetts. They too have joined the coalition and have come out and endorsed. Uh, and, and endorsed us and are in opposition to it. As far as educators go, we have the Massachusetts Association of Superintendents that have um, come out in opposition, all Massachusetts District Attorneys. Uh, we have the uh, Police Chiefs Association of Massachusetts, not up there, and of course elected officials, District Attorney O'Keefe, myself, Governor Charlie Baker, uh, Boston Mayor Marty Walsh, Speaker Robert DeLeo, as you've heard, the Attorney General as well is in opposition to this. And how do we get here? Uh, uh, we had talked about this before. 2008, there was a ballot initiative again. Obviously, the legislation wasn't going to do this, but we decrimin they decriminalized marijuana. That was a decision made by the voters of Massachusetts, not the legislature. And so that's what happened. And it, it, going back to what we, what we learned here is that the industry was the one that was the impetus behind this. The marijuana industry, and they, you know, oh, you, you know, these poor people are going to end up in jail because they sold marijuana. You know, they sold marijuana. I mean, apologize, they smoked wet marijuana. The poor kid ends up in jail. Well, the reality is, is Massachusetts has the lowest rate of anyone going to jail in the in the nation for people um, smoking pot and, and being arrested. So now it's not it, it's not criminalized anymore. In 2012, we uh, opened up to uh, medical marijuana. As you know, that's been quite a quite an issue as well. It's been a very tough rollout, but in fact, 
that was voted on 70-30 in favor by the uh, people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And so here we are today, again, two, uh, four years later, it's decrim, uh, medical marijuana, you know, lower, lower the perception of harm, and now it's uh, total legalization. As the district attorney shared, uh, here is a chart talking about the, uh, the THC content and how much more powerful it was from 1983 to now, uh, you know, this course is up to 2010. It is consistently genetically modified to be uh, more powerful and stronger. When we were in Colorado, we actually spent the entire day with the industry. And they showed us how they extracted the THC out of the, the, the plant, the bud itself. And it was quite an education about the goal. The goal is stronger and stronger potency. And so now you see, what is this ballot question really about? Opening the doors to a billion dollar industry. And that's, as you saw the video earlier, this is all about money. This is just about how can we make more money. It is an incredibly profitable industry. You'll see that there's, a, you know, the people behind this uh, who are funding this campaign that we're going to be facing, that are going to bring millions and millions of dollars out of state money into Massachusetts. And these are just some of those individuals, uh, and you saw that earlier in the video, of who they are. Um, again, they, they are very aggressive in regards to marketing. Right now you don't see this, but when we were in Colorado, every street corner had marketing advertising in regards to marijuana. Just a couple of examples here. You see right there, St. Patty's Special, $17 for an eighth of an ounce. Uh, you know, you bring a coupon, they are giving away, in some places they would actually give away a joint if you, uh, show, you know, went into their business, obviously the goal to get you hooked. And of course, this is all old ideas that they are now recreating because they can get away with it because there's no controls in place. Um, just so you can see here, this is what they were doing in Colorado. See the Pop-Tarts on the right here? See what they, sell? they, they were selling on the left there? Pop-Tarts? Um, Krondike, not Klondike bars, Krondike, as you can see, Keel Cats. These are the types of things that they were doing. And of course, who are we marketing to here? Younger kids. Uh, very, very, as you saw in the, in the earlier presentation, the goal was to go after uh, younger kids, get them hooked, and then of course they'd be lifelong uh, customers. Uh, okay, we've, we've got some more. 50% of the industry's profits in Colorado comes from edibles. And that number is grown. So think about it. People talk about this and they say, you know, this is all just about pot. It's really not. 50% of the industry already in the past two years in Colorado is edibles. It's the cookies, the candies, the gummy bears. You saw one gummy bear is enough to get four people high. And that's what it's fine. So you buy a packet of gummy bears. And what we found is that um, you buy the packet. Somebody has that. They get high. They leave it on the market. They leave it on the countertop. And what has happened? A young kid goes and picks up the gummy bear, eats the gummy bear, ends up in the hospital because of overconsumption of the THC. And we're here, if you see the statistics in Colorado, continuing to increase. You sell a cookie. Uh, a cookie, it tells you now that they have to tell you before they didn't tell you. But on the package, you can't eat a whole cookie. You actually have to break the cookie up into like 10 sections because if you eat the whole cookie, you're going to, you, you, you're going to, I wouldn't say overdose, but you're going to overconsume. It literally will knock you out because of the high content of, uh, of THC in the cookie. Cook, the edibles tend to be 30 to 40 percent THC. Marijuana, say, you know, the marijuana uh, joints tend to be 13 to 18 percent THC. And of course, as we know back in the day of Woodstock, as well, two and a half to three, three THC. Okay, marijuana industry profit model dramatically expand access to marijuana. Can you imagine that just in two years of legalization, there are now more, uh, there are more pot shops than there are McDonald's and Starbucks combined? And that's the same story in Washington State, and Starbucks started in Washington State. So already, in that short window of time, these are everywhere and on, at every corner. And here's an interesting tidbit that you're going to see. In the ballot initiative, um, they try to address this, but in Colorado, all of those sales are only a third of the state because two thirds of the state didn't opt in. They decided not to uh, sell. They, you know, they chose not to allow legalization in their towns, kind of like pro, you know, uh, towns, dry towns in Massachusetts that don't sell alcohol. Well, in, in Colorado, two thirds of the state didn't do it. So that number is only in a third of the state that you see that uh, concentration. 
the district attorney uh, highlighted this. Now, see, this is Colorado. It used to be the fourth in the nation. It is now, uh, in the past month, usually of 12 to 17 year olds. It's the highest in the, in the nation right now. As you can see, uh, Massachusetts right here, right right here, this is about 8% right here. This is close to, you know, I think it's like 13, 14% in Colorado of youth uh, under, the, under the age of, of between 12 and 17 um, that use marijuana on a monthly basis. And so, as you can imagine, that is our concern. I do not, I do not think that Ma Massachusetts, we want Massachusetts to be up here next to Vermont and Colorado. Um, uh, the district attorney spoke about this as well. One in six people who begin using as an adolescent will become addicted. Now they always say it's not addictive, it's not addictive. Every, every study shows that it's actually addictive. They'll say well, maybe it's not as addictive as alcohol or heroin, that may be the case. But it is, addi it is addictive and, the rea and we also know that when you're younger the, the, the um, ability to become addicted is far greater because your, your, your brain is still developing so you become um, more addicted, very similar to OP, the opioid crisis. And of course, the health consequences, uh, you can see here, it's marijuana associated with long-term health risks, including increased accessibility uh, uh, to heart, heart attacks and mental health issues. High potency appears to increase health risks, but more studies. And of course, this is something that's interesting, is they say, well, there's no studies, no studies. Well, the reality is, is the high concentrate is, is a newer, uh, is a newer thing. So a lot of people study the older THC at two and a half percent where it wasn't as addictive. But when you have the high potency that you're seeing, you're going to see uh, more, I believe, a, a greater consequence of addiction. So now the ballot, going to the ballot question. This was written by the industry for the industry. When you see this, there's no limits in the ballot question in regards to, they create what they call a Cannabis Control Commission, and that commission decides what, uh, what should happen. Now, that commission is made up of people in the industry. It says right in the ballot question, that's who's going to be on this, uh, on this ballot initiative. And so they are, going to, they are going to obviously favor the industry. So there's no limits on potency. We talk about, you know, in, everyone talks about uh, the Netherlands and how, you know, uh, in Amsterdam, the legalization of, you know, marijuana, they've had it for years. In the Netherlands, anything over 15% THC is considered a hard drug, and so it's, and it's not legal. In here, we have no limits on potency, and so the, just the, the joint itself is already over that amount. No detail uh, on labeling, no details on labeling requirements or any type of data collection and research. Um, and this is the last point that I think is very important. The ballot question severely limits municipalities and the state's ability to limit the nature and presence of the marijuana industry in their community. So what they learned from Colorado is, is if you allow them to have to opt in, they're not going to do it and it won't be a third of the state. So what they require now is to, for you, have to, you have to vote to opt out. So as a community, it's legal unless the community votes to opt out. So there will be less communities that will have opt out, uh, opt out provisions. And of course, there's a little sweetener in here for communities because if you sell it in your community, the community gets 2% of the tax rate. Um, so that's, you know, that's the angle. So you know, for communities that want revenue, that, that's what they'll do. Um, uh, again, uh, this, is, this is a point that the, the district attorney mentioned this that I think is incredibly important. So they're going to allow, in Colorado, they don't allow you to grow 12 plants. So a husband and a wife over the age of 21 can grow six pot plants each. So that's 12 pot plants for the average homeowner. 12 pot plants, what does that mean? And this is the interesting thing, that a plant can go, grow to full maturity in five months. What does that mean? Full maturity can yield about a pound of marijuana in five months. Well, a pound of marijuana at 200, you know, $250 an ounce, um, which is, you know, an ounce of, you know, an ounce of marijuana. So a pound is significant. So it will yield about $5,000. We have $5,000 times 12, and now we have $60,000 in, 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 in a five-month cycle, obviously in a year, $120,000. And they say the black market's going to go away. I don't care how much of a pot smoker you are, you're not consuming that much. And so if you're allowed to legally grow that, and that's why you're seeing this, people are growing what we call the gray market. It's legal, and then they go around and they turn around and they sell it. And where are they going to sell it? Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, 
They're going to go to New York, New Jersey. Can you imagine, in Marcus, we are going to be the only state in the, on the East Coast that is legal. So we are going to be the epicenter of legalization. This is what's happening in Colorado. However, in Colorado, you know the expanse. It's a lot farther. They're not so close as they are here in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts will be the epicenter of the marijuana industry. And so that's concerns. Not to mention the, 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 you know, the odor, concerns of wastewater, and a whole bunch of other things. This industry is an entirely um, cash business. So here, another concern here is the, the reality of robberies and, and, and the like. So um, I talked about uh, the opt-out provision. It uh, prohibits communities from enacting meaningful, meaningful and nu uh, numerical caps on the amount of stores, which is a, a very big concern, as you see in, and you'll see in the next slide, how many more of these, uh, how many more uh, facilities you're going to see in, college, in, in Denver in this short window of time, and uh, bars communities from restricting home growth. So even if a community says they don't want to sell it and they opt out, you can't stop home growth. Home growth is still going to happen, which is uh, you know another concern. And uh, grants existing marijuana facilities that are right now uh, to stay in the same market. So those who have already medical marijuana will be able to immediately turn to recreational marijuana. So just a quick overview, that's uh, 454 marijuana uh, businesses right in the city of Denver itself. So when you drive in Denver, there's every corner you're going to see these marijuana shops. And it's just, it's so proli prolific in, uh, in that area. So uh, this is additional legal complications. Even if it, it was to pass, it's, there's still a lot of challenges that you need to take on. Uh, for example, state government would need to take on the cost and responsibility of ensuring product safety. Now think about it. You are going to have a billion dollar industry. You're going to be growing marijuana, a billion dollar industry. Well, who makes sure that that stuff is safe? When you're growing a plant, what kind of fertilizer do you use? What kind of pesticides? What kind of herbicides are in this? And are they safe for human consumption to be smoke, you know, to be uh, drawn into your lungs? The reality is, is there, you know, you see this oftentimes, you know, they, you get your lawn fertilized, they tell you don't walk on the lawn, let alone don't ingest it. Right? And that's the, a big concern. So what's had to happen in Colorado, when we, when we, met, with the, uh, when we met with the Commissioner of Agriculture, 80 to 90 percent of his, um, 80 to 90 percent of his job right now is dealing with, med, with med, the marijuana industry. That's all he does. It's not dealing with farms or anything like that. It's the marijuana industry. Because he has to go out there and make sure that the products they're using that are safe. And that they, what they call seed to sale. They, they track the plant that's in there from inception into sale. And so that has to be overseen. And now all of that is regulatory cost. That cost, in this case, would cost the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It doesn't happen for free. And we don't have an FDA or an EPA to help us, the federal government, because the federal government still considers this illegal. And then I shared earlier in regards to banks. No bank will do business with them generally because of the fact that it's still illegal. They do not want to get trouble. Can't use credit cards, can't use checks, all cash business. So this is a billion dollar cash business. You have to pay your employees the same way. So it is, you know, how do you get the workman's compensation, the you know, unemployment insurance tax, all of the other things that are involved in it. So there's a lot of other issues that, that are underneath that we really never, really, I, I guess I never really gave too much thought to it. So now, um, uh, again, we talked about, and the district attorney talked about, no per se blood limit like we have for alcohol. We know that if you're driving under the influence of alcohol, you get pulled over, you blow into a breathalyzer, 0.09, you're, you know, you're going to lose your license, you're going to go to court, you're in trouble. Right here, there is no equivalent breathalyzer test as, as, as the DA shared. And we haven't had a chance to establish procedures and protocols, and clearly no law enforcement training in this in this regard. Uh, what they would do now is if they suspected someone, they'd actually have to do a breath, uh, they'd have to do a blood test. So the next day, you'd end up go do a blood test, and sure enough, you're gonna you're gonna find the you know yeah they had THC in their system. The THC stays in your system for 30 days. So if the marijuana is in your system for 30 days, you can imagine the defense is going to be. Well, I wasn't high when I was driving. I had been high three days earlier, and so that's why. It, and of our concern is it gets thrown out in court. And I believe that's the that's what you've seen already as, as a case. So going back to um, the, the AAA study, which just came out just a couple weeks ago, and we we were floored because this was one of our biggest concerns about drug driving. But marijuana was legalized in 2014 in Washington State, 
And that year, 17% of the fatal crashes involved pot. Up from 8% a year earlier. And so what does that mean? 47 people died in 2013. 106 died in 2014. In one year, with the concern of drug driving. Okay, and so the, the, this is what the industry says. Marijuana is going to make it safer, uh, it's safer than alcohol, so we should regulate marijuana just like alcohol. Um, and I think we understand why um, this is a, a bigger challenge for us for, for the me reasons I shared earlier. Um, and, you know, again, alcohol, we, we know the, the, the problems that we have with alcohol. Is it a good idea to create another substance that's going to create more problems? Um, and if we vote yes, it's pretty clear, you're going to see youth consumption increase. You can't create a billion dollar industry and not have more people using the product. It's going to be so readily available on every street corner. More accessibility means more use. Now they'll tell you that the studies, as we were, that you saw on the thing, that in the uh, video, that, uh, oh yeah, the, the consumption hasn't increased at all amongst youth. I, I totally disagree. There's no way that you can have create a billion dollar industry and not have any implications uh, on youth. And of course we know the health risks and we know the, the reality of uh, the addictive substance and the challenges that we're already facing right now with the opiate crisis. There isn't one person here that hasn't been touched by the, the opiate crisis and, we, and the challenge of addiction would be, is it smart to open up another door? They'll also say that it'll take, the, you know, take it out, marijuana out of the hands of criminals. Uh, we know that that's not the case. We've seen what's happened in Colorado. The black market is, is thriving. As a matter of fact, they've they become exporters um, as the DA shared. Uh, and uh, this is an economic driver for the Commonwealth. This is a great point here. In Colorado, 28% tax in regards to marijuana in Colorado. Washington State is a 37% tax. Well, the industry was so successful uh, in Massachusetts over the past election cycles, they decided that they were going to do the, the excise tax at 3.75% excise tax. So for the revenue, uh, the mayor, uh, the, I'm sorry, the governor of Hickenlooper in, in, in uh, Washington, uh, I'm sorry, in Colorado, will tell you that if you're doing this for money, don't bother because whatever we're spending is basically regulating, is to regulate the industry. Not talking about the unintended consequences, but just to regulate the industry. So that's at 28 percent. We're going to be at 3.75 percent, and and they they are going to allow us to they're going to allow us to, to put on the sales tax of 6.25. So it's a total of 10 percent. Again, that's two thirds less tax revenue. So it really isn't an economic driver for the Commonwealth. There isn't a lot of revenue that comes into the Commonwealth, not not only for regulation, but where they talk about for schools and and the like. So uh, another, cons another issue that I think you can take to say this isn't good. A lot of people say, yeah, just tax, you know, just legalize it and tax it and, and we'll get all kinds of money. The reality is it's going to cost us a lot more money. So we'll be taking money away from education, public safety, the environment, and, and the like. So that's something else to be, to be mindful of. And of course, in closing, what, what are people saying uh, right now? Why would we even think uh, about tinkering with the thoughts of legalization, knowing what happened? To, the, uh, to this generation right now. I mean, it's pretty clear we've seen this. Why in the world would we do this? Um, this was the governor, the mayor, uh, and the attorney general. They did an editorial uh, to Boston Globe, and this is what they had to share. Our state's already, de uh, already decriminalized the drugs for personal use. We've made it legally, legally available for medical use. The question before us is now whether marijuana should be fully legal and widely available for commercial sale. We all universally think the answer is no. And, if, and, and lastly, this was an editorial by the Boston Globe. If drug dealers seem difficult now, wait until they have lobbyists, <laughs> which was a very powerful statement. It is, um, when this comes, and we noticed this when we were in Colorado, all of a sudden, industry's now legal, the lobbyists, every, you know, they're now buying up all the lobbyists, and they're all trying to push and try to fight back on any type of legislation that restricts their industry more. And we were shocked at how quickly that happened in just two years in the, in the, in the state of Colorado. They were everywhere, and that's what you're going to see happen here. And that's why I think you're seeing a lot of people in Colorado, in the political world, become quiet. Right now we're fortunate that we have some leaders that are standing up and saying we don't want this for Massachusetts and they're coming out there but my fear is once this becomes legal you're going to have a lot of people uh, coming out there and, and pushing back. 
And uh, these are just, just for, for, for those of you who want more information, uh, this is our website, Safe and Healthy Massachusetts. That's a Twitter account. And there's a special Senate committee report. It's about 117 pages long. That was the group of us, the eight of us that went. And we, uh, we have some facts. Literally compare uh, apples to oranges in regards to what's actually happening in Colorado, what they, what they presented in Washington State, and of course, Massachusetts. So you'll see side by side here how it, this ballot initiative is different. And so this isn't just legalizing you know, marijuana, yes or no. This is allowing a ballot initiative that will increase, create and commercialize an entire industry, which we believe is very concerning. And so to that, I am now, uh, I think we're all set here. I, uh, we are, Paul, you're going to take this over. We appreciate it. Paul's got one other, uh, one other thing that he's going to do. And then if any of you have questions, uh, certainly the district attorney or myself, I will try to answer some. You said this is an all-cash business. That's a little bit scary. Um, how do we, as taxpayers of the state, actually think there's going to be any accountability for taxes if it's an all-cash business? Can a lot of this be under the table? I mean, how, where, where's the accounting? It, it, it becomes so very that, difficult, as you can imagine. And we met with the Commissioner work. of Revenue in Colorado. And of course, you know, if you have a facility and you're growing, they actually will stamp the, you know, the, each plant, so as they say, they track it from seed to sale, and then when they sell it, that's how they tend to follow it. Um, however, I would imagine there's a lot of slippage there when it's it's cash, and there's a reason that um, uh, there's a reason that I think that you see nowadays that you know that with you know a lot of businesses with you know credit card business and, and checks, you're able to track that much easier. Uh, and with, with the bank, so the uh, you know IRS and the Department of Revenue gets its share. It will be much more difficult. There's no question about it when it's all cash, especially as we talk about the home grows. I think that's fair to say the home grows with 12 plot plants per home. They can grow up to $120,000 in a year in one home. Uh, you can imagine they're probably not calling the Department of Revenue just to let them know how much they made this past year. So I think that that's an issue. Yeah, uh, yeah and and you know the. Uh, this idea of seed to sale, tagging the plant, and all that—you know—that's that's a pipe dream. Uh, that, you know, that, the reason that that these uh, cartels, if you will, are moving into the states that have legalized this recreationally is they're hiding in plain sight. They have these grows that are enormous, um, and they're exporting the stuff all over the place. So, you know, once you legalize, this is one of those things that you open this door and let this in, and, you know, the, the unintended consequences are going to be dramatic. Somebody else, go ahead. Okay, Steve, and, Steve, and then Carlos. Uh, I read a study about 35 years ago, and this was granted the old 2% marijuana, that the THC latches onto the fatty tissue in your brain, and that's most of your brain is not water, it's fat. And the, the uh, impairment lasted for 60 days, according to, the, uh, according to the study. Now, is there some way you can go to a study like this and fashion a law concerning impaired driving? Since you know, we're going crazy with the cell phones and the texting, certainly this is more dire. Wouldn't you agree? Well, I mean, you have to, you know, you, there, there is now. Just repeat. Yeah, that's fine. Everybody. Did everybody hear the question? Yeah. But, but even now in California, they're, they're in uh, probably Silicon Valley somewhere. They're, they're developing a machine that's going, that's going to be uh, the sort of breathalyzer, if you will, for marijuana. It's terribly expensive. Um, it, it, and, and if if we're dumb enough, frankly, to legalize this, and uh, you know, ultimately we will have to equip every police department, just as we do now with breathalyzers, to deal with that issue. It's going to be terribly expensive, and as as Vinny, you know, mentioned from going through the slides, you know, the promise originally in Colorado is we're going to, you know, from the revenue from this, we're going to build schools, we're going to repair the infrastructure, we're going to do all this stuff, at taxing at three times the rate that we're proposing to tax it by this law, they can barely keep up with the regulatory costs, never mind the unintended consequences of health, 
police, uh, and all of those issues. So what do you think is going to happen here in Massachusetts? The taxpayer is going to pick up the difference, or else we're going to have the thing just completely running amok. So this, we're going to be enriching an industry and paying to do it. Carlos next, and then you have a question. Now my question is that uh, I'm very impressed with the presentation. That's because I'm your nephew. <laughs> I mean, we're doing a lot of this. Yeah, I will, I will say to, to that extent, this is why the governor, the attorney general, the mayor, and the speaker created safe, uh, a campaign for safety and health in Massachusetts. We are going around the, straight, the state. The reason we're doing this is because we know that this is the only way we can do it, grassroots. We don't have the money to advertise. This is a presidential election. The money that it costs to advertise and during the presidential election in the last months of a, of a campaign are just astronomical. So the only way that we can do this is to do this. And so this is why on a Sunday evening, the district attorney and myself are here to get, get to you because we believe the grassroots is where this is going to be successful. It is you having some information because you now know that the tax rate, how many people knew what the tax rate was for the ballot question and what it was in Colorado and what it was in Washington State before? You didn't know that. How many of you knew that you could grow 12 pot plants in your home and that could yield $120,000? You didn't know that. How many of you knew that AAA came out with that study that traffic accidents, fatalities, has doubled in one year? These are facts that you can take and start sharing with people, and that's the type of stuff that gets that person to kind of say, you know what, it's really not a big deal. Come on, this episode we spoke in the joint, it's not a big deal. It's those facts that make people think, you know, wait a second, because we know, we, do, we are not prepared, even if you're comfortable with this, we're not prepared as a society to be able to go after drug driving. We don't have the tools. We don't even understand how big a problem this is because we don't have the database. That was the, one of the number one issues we heard from the Colorado officials. Get some baseline data. If you're gonna legalize this, Find out. Find out how many kids are being expelled from school because they're high on them. Find out how many accidents are happening because people are high on marijuana. Not just drugs, but marijuana. You need to get some kind of baseline before you allow this. So even if you think this is a good idea, let the Commonwealth wait until we have some better information, better data, before we walk down this, this area. And again, to your question, the only way we're going to do this is the grassroots. That's why we're here. That's why there's all these people in this room that are going to go and replicate the story. Because I'll tell you, I didn't know all these facts. And it wasn't until I went and learned, and then we started creating this commission. And, we, and we, he and I are on this email chain. The information that we get you know, on a daily basis to understand, oh my gosh, I, I did not believe what an issue this really was. And of course, a lot of people are trying to hide this because they think, oh, come on. You know, they, they want to legalize it. There's a lot of money in this. But, but be, you know, since we have a, an audience here that uh, is interested in the subject, you can go to www. Uh, safe and healthy mass and donate and there's a portal there to do that and even if it's five bucks it's going to be helpful to us let me ohio which recently defeated this they raised the people in opposition to legalizing marijuana raised four million dollars the proponents trying to legalize it had 40 million the four million won because the message is better. And if we have the ability to put this message out all over the Commonwealth during, you know, from Labor Day to the election, we're going to win. But as Vinny said, you're talking about a million plus per commercial to saturate the state during that presidential cycle. That's the problem. So, you know. When? That's outrageous. I can't believe you asked that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, all of those statistics are available on the website. As far as uh, getting you know, paper out there, as you can imagine, that 117 page report for all of these people would have been very expensive. Um, and so we, we, and of course, put this presentation. But this yeah, but that is on the website. But it's all on the website. So it is available on the website if you want to yeah, get there's that a very, There's a very simple and concise 
sort of two-page summary that yes. you, you know, I think you'd find very helpful. That's is, is this kind of presentation being given in our schools? I'm, I'm sure most principals are welcome. That's a little bit of a challenge, and the, re and the reason is, is this is a political campaign. So uh, my, my office can't deal with this. Uh, the district attorney and I can. We're, politi we're public, political people, so we can come out here and do this. But our staffs can't come out here and do because this. Because they're state employees. Because they're state employees. So if you go into a school, um, you're going to have an issue in regards to that, because this is a pub you know, public property. It is a political campaign. A ballot question in favor or against. They can go into schools. They, they, and yeah, in fact, they, they, they are going into schools, and we have a lot of others that are going in telling their stories. And when you tell the stories, and that the entry level drug that got them addicted was marijuana, uh, that that is happening, right? You're getting more and more invitations. Yeah. We're working with the various superintendents to try to get uh, Teen Challenge to tell their stories in the schools. Okay. Any other? If you know anyone on a home school association, you can get them, that's an avenue, because they're very concerned about their, they're the most concerned parents about their kids, because they're willing to volunteer to help. Yeah, you know homeschool co-ops, they can go and do the same yeah, presentation right here, so if you that's want right. to do that. Yeah. So anyone else, I, I, I think we, oh yes? Um, so you were saying, uh, the, to go on uh, Safe Healthy Mass, uh, you can donate money. Um, it's a two-part question, I was just wondering how much money has actually been donated so far for this campaign. And, it, it, we just started about a month ago, and so we, you know we're, we're in the infancy of, of raising money. This was a you know a realization that we would have to deal with this, and so it has progressed. Uh, initially, it was just like okay, we're going to come out and be in opposition. We've come to the realization that we have to get this message out there. The more we know, the more we realize we've got to do something, and so we don't know what we're going to raise. We're just going to try hard. We're going to get out there. We're going to ask everybody help us. We'll do what we're doing here. You know, donate so that we can get the message out there. We actually have hired a person that, that actually has coordinated, put this together. Is you know is kind of our coordinating person because. You know, we have, you know, we have day jobs and, you know, <laughs> um, this isn't all we do. So there is a, you know, there is cost associated with this. And of course, there's going to be significant cost to do some type of advertising, kind of create uh, pamphlets that are out there to kind of educate people that you would have that information. And so um, it is, we've got a long way to go. And as you heard, we're going to be outnumbered, outgunned, big time. But the facts are on our side, no question about it. Yeah, can the PA explain that uh, just recently we had an accident with lost one of our state troopers? Yes. Uh, he left seven children, by the way. No. Right. He was ready to do marijuana. Right. What we'll do is just bits and pieces. You can't have right. to figure it out. They don't want to tell the truth. In the other incident in Ohio, they had some kind of a gangland sling that they killed the mother and the father of the kids. Right. That was in a new set. Marijuana grows. It's yeah. a cocktail. So right. It's like, how does that all come together? Well, I mean, you know, the drug business, whether it's marijuana or cocaine or heroin, is a is a violent business. This idea of, you know, you you, you hear of, you know, oh, we're warehousing these nonviolent drug users in prison. If any touched a little bit on that, nobody goes to jail in Massachusetts and hasn't for years, long before two thousand eight, for the simple use of marijuana. But yet, the people who are in business will protect their business with guns and violence, and it happens all the time. Um, and to think that that's going to go away because we legalize it for people over 21 is just a sophistry, you know. So, you know, we, we really have to look at these things. With respect to Trooper Clardy, if that doesn't put in bold relief what this is really all about. Here was the defendant, had just left the medical marijuana dispensary where he bought three doses, you know, whatever, and in the, on the floor of his car was found a half-smoked marijuana blunt. And so it's from that evidence and the fact that he had just left the place where he bought three and only had two left, that that's the kind of evidence that will allow a prosecution for driving while under the influence of drugs. Because you have that very particular 
evidence. And so, um, you know, it, I, I just, I hope they're successful. I think they, they will be. Is this, do you think this will promulgate some new regulation under the uh, medical marijuana laws of that? Well, you know, they certainly are, you know, talking about that in the newspaper and, you know, uh, different, uh, you know, public officials are talking about that. But, um, you know, just think about this. There are 25,000 or so medical marijuana cards that have now been issued in Massachusetts. The statute that was passed, again, by you, the voters, uh, enumerates eight different medical conditions, cancer, glaucoma, and diabetes, several others, and then other. 22, 92% or 20, 2,000 plus of these cardholders are suffering from other. You know? so, I mean, it, it was the stalking horse for the ultimate legalization. As Vinny said, I've been at this since, in 2008, it was just the DAs. We were out, you know, running around the state like idiots saying, this is bad, you know, don't decriminalize this. It's only going to lead to more use. You know, George Soros put $12 million into our, we raised like 250,000 bucks. We got killed. And then we went, the next step was in this incremental effort to legalize drugs. And let me tell you, the effort to do this isn't stopping at marijuana. They want to legalize all drugs. So, you know, we see this incremental march, decriminalization, then medical marijuana, and now ultimately recreational marijuana. And at every stage where that progression has taken place, with each step, the use by kids has increased, the use by adults has increased. It's, you know, it's just like, you know, uh, cigarettes. It's just like cigarettes. That's what that first video is all about. And of course, these companies, you think about every business is they want to expand, they want more people to smoke their brand. So you're going to see this people competing for, I've got the better product that can get you, I guess in this case, higher. Right. And so, um, you know, think about those advertisements all the time. And think about the fact that not only are the 21-year-olds going to see it, but so aren't those people younger going to see it. And at, le at least this fact we all know, and we know this because of the opiate crisis. When you are under the age of 25 years old, your brain is still developing, the chances of addiction become far greater when you're young. And that's why you see the candies, the cookies, the gummy bears. They say that it's, you know, because that's how people want to consume it. The reality is they know that that's more attractive to young people. And that is why we are so passionate about doing this. We just, we realize that this is a battle, um, a battle for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, of what, what it's going to look like 10 years from now. And we have a chance in 2016 in November to stop it with your help. So with that, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity 